everyone, just like you guys asked for, today's video is going to be the second part of us reviewing Jackie Hill Perry's book, Gay Girl, Good God, the book in which she decides to stop being a lesbian and find God. Yes, it is as ridiculous as it sounds. If you want to go see the first part, if you haven't seen it already, I'll link that down below. We're also going to be doing a part three after this, in which we look at the last section of the book. So today, the second section that we're going to be looking at is called Who I Became. And in this part of the book, she talks about who she became after she found religion and she decided to stop dating girls. There's a hell of a lot I want to say about this book and this section in particular, a lot of it really shocked me. And as I was reading this book, it made me so sad. Like, I actually, ugh, this is gonna sound really stupid, but it really like brought down my mood and it just made me feel so sorry for her. There's a lot of things you might notice as we read it where, you know when you're in school and you're doing English Lit or whatever you might call it in your country, but in my school it was English Literature and it was about like, you know when you look at books and you read books and you really dive into them and pick apart all the linguistic techniques and stuff and sometimes, you know, you'll <laughs> there are jokes and stuff about how um, the author makes the curtains blue and your English teacher tells you it's because it's mimicking um, the state of like the author's mind and how he or she is depressed and sad and this and this and when in reality you're like, no, no, the curtains were just blue. Like I know there's a lot of jokes about that, but if you apply those same techniques of literary analysis to this book, I think you'll find some really interesting things, some really like subtle hints about what I think Jackie, Jackie Hill Perry feels, but maybe doesn't realise she feels. So as we go through certain parts of this, I want you to really listen to and focus on the language she uses when she talks about women and her relationships with women, and then focus on the language and her word choice when she talks about men, when she talks about religion, when she talks about her life now. The... Uh, I'm trying to put this in the right way. The sentences she says make it seem like dating women is a bad thing and being, like, worshipping God and being with men is a good thing. But the undertones, the sense that I'm getting, the, the choice of words and so on, kind of say the opposite. Like, I'll, I'll try and point it out as we come to it. I just want you to kind of bear that in mind as we read certain passages and I find it very interesting. I think it says a lot about Jackie's unconscious or subconscious feelings and she might deny it but yeah I don't know we're just gonna read it and see what we think and then bring up some talking points and then we can discuss it down in the comments. Before we do get started though I do want to do a little bit of shameless self-promotion kind of ish. On March the 5th I'm gonna be doing a charity stream with Mr. Atheist and Telltale. I love those two guys they're absolutely amazing. We're doing it to raise money for a really really important and amazing charity called Cap for Kids who help and support young children who are going through cancer treatments and provide help and support for their families as well. They have a lot of volunteers who like dress up as comic book characters and film characters and stuff and they go and they like meet the kids and it's really really amazing. You can find out a little bit more about what they do from the links that I'm going to leave down in the description below but it's a charity that I didn't know about before Mr. Atheist told me about it and now I absolutely love what they do. I think it's a perfect charity for us to support. My family has been affected by cancer a hell of a lot so it's something that I feel really strongly about and it's really close to my heart. So if you can support in any way that would be really really amazing. There is a link down in the description below where you can go and donate. Um, I'm also going to leave it as a pinned comment on this video. Like I say, if you can support it all, that would be absolutely amazing. All of the money is going to cap for kids. It's going to be really great. And if you can't support, at least come along on March the 5th and join us for the live stream. Get involved in the conversation, talk to us, just come watch and support that way. We would all really, really, really appreciate it. Okay, plug over, thank you. <laughs> Let's get into this book. So where we just left this book, Jackie had had a tough life. She also was surrounded by incredibly homophobic people who hated gay people but she was in a very happy, loving relationship with a woman. But her relationship with her mother was starting to fall apart, her homophobic mother, and she was feeling a lot of pressure from her family and friends and the people around her who didn't want her to be gay. And then one day she thinks that she hears God in her head talking to her, and she's like, I shouldn't be gay anymore. So she breaks up with her girlfriend and decides that she's now found God and she's a Christian. Yay. <laughs> so following from this, she says, 
I arrived at work the next day a new creature. Though my soul was much different, my clothes were the same. She says the clothes she was wearing, which were quite masculine, didn't feel normal anymore. One of her co-workers commented that, you just look brighter. She says maybe he noticed that the veil had been removed, but didn't know what to call it. Not commenting on any specifics here, but I think, you know, this is definitely a thing that actually happens. When you have a change in attitude yourself, or you realize something or make a change in your life, yeah, I think other people do start to notice just in how you're acting, your demeanor, and so on. So yeah, I do believe this. This bit's a bit weird. She says, it felt weird to enter back into the world after meeting God. Now I knew God was watching. This is the thing I find a little bizarre. And I don't mean to be disrespectful when I say this, because yes, I'm an atheist and I don't believe there's an actual God and so on, but I do try and be respectful of the people who do believe there's a God. That said, when people like Jackie try and claim that God literally talks to them in their head, or that they've literally seen God, it does leave me a little bit worried and concerned, because if anyone else said this about anything else, for example, someone said they were hearing voices of a ghost, or Satan, or Bob who lives down the road, or a yeti in their head. They would probably be sectioned. If someone said they had literally seen a unicorn while lying in bed one night, it just came to them and there was a vision and they were definitely talking to a unicorn in front of them. If anyone said that, again, they'd be called crazy and insane and be told they were mentally ill. So why is it socially acceptable and normal for someone to say they were talking to God, for whom we have no more proof than yetis and unicorns? To me, the whole thinking she's actually talking to God thing is again a sign of her insecurity, her vulnerability, her... Honestly, I think she has some, I, I guess, mental problems? I don't, I don't want to say that in like a bad way, um, like it's nothing to be ashamed of, I don't want it to come across as like I'm putting her down, but yeah, I think she definitely has some issues that she needs to see a counsellor and a psychiatrist for, and this is just how they're manifesting. And if you seen the last video, you'll understand where these problems come from. It's very, very understandable, it's just... I do think it's a real shame that she's choosing to ignore these problems and just pass it off as, well, I'm happy now that I've found God. Yeah, I'm definitely happy, honestly, I'm happy. Instead of actually getting some help and learning to accept herself for who she is and so on, I just, I think it's sad. She goes on to talk about how, while she's at work the next day, even though she's decided she doesn't want to be a lesbian anymore. She still notices women. She's like, I noticed a girl standing in line. She was beautiful. I could have without question done what I'd always done and allowed this body to rule me. And then she goes on and says, um, she was like serving a customer, but I kept noting noticing her smile behind them. I sensed in me a conflict of interest. Surely I could get her if I wanted to, and I wanted to. Um, she also says that things like, there she was, as pretty as can be. So she wants this woman, but then she also says, but I also wanted something else. God. In me was his strange conviction that there was another route he wanted me to go, another beauty he made for me to delight in, and I didn't know what to do with myself. Is this what it feels like to be a Christian, I thought to myself? Is it to have a quiet war inside you all at all times? <laughs> if it is, that's not something I'd want. I just, I don't understand why people would choose to be unhappy and have these internal conflicts constantly. For me, religion is so much about, like, guilt and shame and making pe people feel constantly guilty and shameful, telling them you're never good enough, you're not going to be good enough, you constantly have to keep working because you're never going to be good, you have to be constantly working to be okay. And I could not live my life like that, even if I did believe there was a god, I just, I couldn't do that, it would be so depressing. She makes some really interesting points here about um, a lot of Christian people she knows, and she says, I'd met so many disciples who preached more of sin than joy. I just wonder if they would have told me about the beauty of God just as much, if not more, than they told me about the horridness of hell, if I would have burned my idols at a faster pace. So basically, in this whole section, she talks about how she didn't come to God sooner, because apparently all she'd ever heard was about how God is going to save you from hell, and how if you don't do this, you're going to hell, and this, and hell, and hell, and sin, and sin, and hell. This explains a lot of her motivations, to be honest, because she has been made to feel guilty and like she's a bad person and there's something wrong with her in her entire life. And so it makes sense why she's now having these like delusions of hearing voices in her head. It makes sense why she's unable to accept herself for who she is despite there being nothing wrong with who that person is. I think a lot of religions choose to go down the guilt and shame route because it is a more powerful motivator 
than positive reinforcement. And I mean, what really positive things do religions have to offer? Basically, when you look at things like Christianity, a lot of it is saying, well, if you sin and do these bad things and don't worship God, then you're going to hell where you're going to be like tortured for all eternity and it's going to be horrific. And if you do do good things, then you don't get that. They don't really offer much of a positive incentive other than, well, you get to be with God and God's good because he's God. So I understand why religions do it, but again, yeah, it's just not really a selling point for me. She does go on to talk about how now she still thinks like, oh, well, you know, being with God is a nice feeling. She says, I was now able to want God because the Holy Spirit was after my affections just as much as he was after my obedience. A bit demanding. She talks about how in the past, sin had had my attention because it had had my heart in it. I did not merely put up with sin, but I loved it, delighted in it, adored it. I find it very interesting how when she talks about sin, she does use these words like delight, adore, love. And then when she talks about God, it's about obedience and discipline and um, oh, I can't think of any other examples now. Again, keep keep listening out for them. We will come to them and you'll start to notice this stuff. Then she talks about how she can now see sin for the liar that it is. Um, I was very aware that I wanted to choose God, but I didn't know how. And even if I did, would I be able to? I didn't know any verses to quote just yet, but I figured I should pray. God, can you help me? Amen. So she's like stood at work, praying to God. Yeah, again, this is kind of like one of her weird delusions. I'm like, if anyone said this about anything other than religion, we would call them delusional, right? She says that in response to this, th this happened. Of course, bystanders wouldn't have noticed the temple or the veil or the throne room of God. All they saw was me, a cash register and an indecisive restaurant patron. But I was there, face and body bowed before him. His feet were inches from my hands, I lifted my head just enough to notice mercy and grace coming toward me. Before I knew it, I was back with the same temptation and someone else's power. When salvation has taken place in the life of someone under the sovereign hand of God, they are set free from the penalty of sin and its power. In a body without the spirit, sin is an unshakable king under whose dominion no man can flee. God takes back the body that he created for himself. He sets it free from the pathetic master that once held it captive and releases it to the marvellous light of its saviour. It's then able to not only want God, but it's actually able to obey God. And isn't that what freedom's supposed to be? The ability to not do as I please, but the power to do what is pleasing. N no, I'm pretty sure that's the opposite of what freedom is. She's got this so backwards. It's really bizarre. Also, this constant message she keeps coming back to about how God takes back the body he created for himself, meaning her body. She talks about how her body, her mind, her actions, non none of them are her own. They all belong to God. Everything she does is for God. Everything she is was created by God, for God, for him to use and own and take possession of. And I just think a lot of young women are going to be reading this book. And to tell any young person, man or woman, to be honest, that their body isn't their own, to tell any young person that their mind isn't their own, to tell any young person that they don't belong to themselves and they aren't completely in control of their body, their life, their choices, I just think is a really dangerous and damaging thing. And I don't think it's a message we should be encouraging. I think it's completely inappropriate. She goes back to talking about her girlfriend that she bro just broke up with. She says, I missed her eyes the most. And I find this like really interesting because when she talks about this woman that she loved, there is so much love and tenderness and kindness in her words. And I think it's very clear that this relationship wasn't just about sex. It was about love and friendship and commitment and being a family, a team together. And I think that should say something to her. I think that should prove to her that, you know, just because she was in love with a woman, it doesn't make it a bad thing. The fact that she was in love and found someone that she cares so deeply about is something that should be celebrated. And I just, I don't get how she can turn this wonderful, amazing thing into something dark and call it a sin controlled by a pathetic master. It's just insane to me. She goes on and says, All I wanted to do was hold a woman just once. I craved the interaction that gave lesbians their name. She says, Being a Christian delivered me from the power of sin, but in no way did it remove the possibility of tem temptation. Like, well, yes, that's because what you think of as the possibility of temptation is just your sexuality. It's just who you are, and you can't change that. It's a part of your makeup, your DNA, your personality. She says something that I find really weird down here, where she says, I and all humans had the unique disadvantage 
of having given given into the passions of the body so easily and so often before Christ that like and then blah blah blah. But I'm like, I and all humans had the unique disadvantage. Not really unique if it happens to everyone is it i found that weird she says learning how to experience same-sex attraction and not act on it was frustrating it would have been easier if when god cleansed me of my sin he also took the taste for it out of my mouth or maybe that's a sign that god isn't powerful he isn't all powerful yeah if god's supposed to be all powerful why can't he just take away you wanting to do something that he thinks is bad or why allow you to feel that way in the first place it makes no sense there's so many plot holes in the bible <laughs> And if he could take it away and he chooses not to, to just let you suffer because he's like testing you or something, sounds like a bit of a douche, doesn't he? Uh, she says it's really hard to like, you know, avoid being with women, looking at women, wanting to be with a woman. She says my back showing signs of wear and tear from the cross it was carrying day to day was weary. She talks about the earth starting to look like heaven and God a fading cloud. She prays and said, God, I'm really struggling. I want to go back so bad. Lord, help me. Quieted and listening, my mind held in in it, this sentence. Jackie, you have to believe my word is true, even if it contradicts how you feel. Again, she thinks God is talking to her. Again, anyone else hearing voices would be called crazy. Why is this accepted? Why is this different? <sighs> Temptation was slapping me around like a weightless doll in the hands of an imagined child. The struggle with homosexuality was a battle of faith. To give in to temptation would be to give in to unbelief. To decide that the body mattered more than God, or that the pleasure of sin would sustain all that I am better than he. Their power was an illusion. What's really interesting in all this is that she talks about how, you know, she doesn't want to let these sins have any power over her. She talks about how, you know, sin comes from the devil and that only God can cleanse you and blah blah blah. But she never talks about why something like homosexuality is a sin in the first place. She just accepts that it is because that's what she's been told. And again, I just, I find this really bizarre because I'm like, well, I want to do good things because I know that they're going to have good effects on other people. I don't want to do good things just because someone says they're good without me knowing why they're good. I don't think she has the ability to like, no, no, that's not true. Maybe she has the ability, but I don't think she has the will to critically assess her actions, her choices, her decisions, her morality and her ethic to understand why something is good or bad. She doesn't want to critically assess what makes something a sin and why something is sinful or not. Her go-to answer is just because God says it or because the Bible. And again, I just think that's really damaging. Ugh. This next bit I think is really telling when she says, find a human alive and ask them if they have ever lied and you will find none who can say, no, I have not. But God is not a man that he would or could lie. Every single thing he has ever or will ever say is true. The simplicity of faith is this, taking God's word for it. And I might not have felt like it, but I had no choice but to believe him. Again, this to me just says like, they're clearly the words of a desperate and emotionally distressed woman in a very vulnerable situation. And things like religion are filling that void for her. Um, but also I think the churches she's visiting and the people around her are using religion to take advantage of her. This doesn't sound like freedom to me. The next chapter talks about how she goes to church like properly for the first time now that she's found God. She borrowed clothes that she thinks are traditionally feminine. She said, I, I had forgotten that women wore clothes that were always five seconds away from being too small for their size. That That's not healthy or normal. No. I didn't want to deal with the stares and the shame it would carry if I came dressed as myself, so I conceded to being someone else. That's not healthy. And then she talks about how she meets a woman at the church who asks her name and then like does that repeating bad thing to remember the name. She says, I had never met a stranger who wanted to know my name as if it mattered. That's really sad. My sexuality had been my name for so long that to have someone not treat me according to my assumed sins, but according to the identity that my mama gave me, felt good. With her, I didn't feel like a project to be fixed, but a person to be loved. That is how you should feel all the all the time, regardless of whether you're gay or straight or bi or anything. I don't care if you're asexual or pansexual or transgender or whatever, or you know, you could be a cis heterosexual person like me. The point is, you always deserve to feel like a human being who is loved and respected and worth it. You're not a project for people to fix, and your sexuality is never something that needs fixing or changing. It's just who you are. It's so sad that she didn't feel this way until she's decided to hide that side of her or cover up that side of her or 
fix that side of her. It's so sad that she sees her sexuality as something that needs fixing instead of just an arbitrary thing of who she is. That makes sense. Your sexuality is of like no more good or bad than your eye colour. And this whole thing about her sexuality had been her name for so long. Again, this is just so bizarre to me. Like when I meet people for the first time, I don't look at them and think, ooh, are they gay or not? Like that's, that's so bizarre. And the fact that she puts so much emphasis on her sexuality that she used it as her identity. Again, it speaks a lot about her insecurities and it's more to do with her personal issues than it is to do with sexuality and gender issues in general. Does this make sense? Am I am I making sense? I'm kind of just rambling here. I was I, actually it was quite interesting. Um I was out with some friends the other week and I kind of like overheard this part of a conversation that I kind of like then jumped into about um I think they were talking about like internalized homophobia and one of my friends was saying how like oh well you know I think it is a thing because like yeah I sometimes get a little bit defensive if people ask me if I'm gay or not. And I was like I don't I don't get that. And I was like, I, I really couldn't care less if someone thinks I'm gay or straight or makes an assumption about me. Like, it, it's not anything to be ashamed of or proud of or defensive about or anything. And they were like, oh, well, that's that's really good. And then um, another friend turned around and she was like, she asked about like some of the sort of pro-LGBT stuff I do on YouTube and that. And she was like, so why are you pro-LGBTQ plus whatever, like r rights and stuff? And I was like, why wouldn't I be? I find it so bizarre that that's like a question that has to be asked, like, well, why do you support gay marriage? Why do you support equal rights? Why do you support this? I'm like, why wouldn't I? Do you know what I mean? It really kind of like struck me as a bizarre question. I was like, I don't know how to answer this other than why wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, my other friend Rosie would kind of like love that answer, but we were all quite drunk at that point anyway, so. <laughs> Anyway, then she talks about the gay community and how she was leaving one community for another, the gay community for the church community. She said, the gay community is called that for a reason. It is a community, a collective of people with different names, social statuses, eating habits, upbringings, and more, but with one commonality shared among them that made all made them all more alike than not their sexuality. I get that having like a gay community where people could feel safe and kind of apart from the rest of the world was needed at one point when homophobia was so like rampant and you know people weren't just accepted but I think the way forward isn't to kind of separate us and them it's to just accept people of all sexualities and preferences and whatever and just get on with life and not feel the need to separate people but whatever you know she says so to leave that community for another one was terrifying and of course it is when you leave one massive group of friends and then just like cut yourself off from them completely and join another new massive group of friends that's already well established and whatever yeah that's going to be terrifying you know it's like when you change jobs or schools or go to university or move to a new town or city, it's terrifying. But you didn't need to do this. You didn't need to leave one community for the other. It is possible to be gay and Christian if that's what you really want, and we shouldn't have these divides where you have to choose between one and the other. She says, uh, the gay community that I had called home for a season of my life were all full of laughter and what I'd labelled life, but the reality was that my gay community was indeed lifeless. They were what I had been. Dead bit harsh. She says, I still loved them, but I loved God more. Um, and then she talks about this woman she met online called Santoria. I think, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, she's like some YouTuber who talks about God and stuff. And she talks about this woman as though she's like a, I think she labels herself as like a disciple to her or something like that. And like this woman starts like guiding her and telling her what to do and this and this and this. It all sounds very controlling and a little bit, I don't want to say abusive, but like without actually seeing it and knowing her and being there, but I don't get the best vibes from this. Uh, she talks about how this woman, she pulled her up and made her feel really bad because when Jackie started writing poetry, this Santoria woman turned around and was like, stop taking pride in your work, it's a sin, and basically like beat her down once she was starting to feel good about herself. So th this is why I kind of get these weird like, abusive partner vibes from her but from a friend so she's told when she's writing poetry um as is expected when humans get their hands on anything they start thanking themselves for what was made as if their mind was not a borrowed thing now ah, yes because you should never take credit for your own work and feel good about the good things you've done 
such an awful, terrible message to tell people. It's okay to take a little bit of pride in yourself and feel good when you've done something good. Obviously, don't let that extend to arrogance. Don't let that extend to, like, you being a complete narcissist. But there's nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself every now and again. She says that this Santoria woman uh, took notice of this in her. Uh, the untangled pride I mistook for confidence, as if it moved in and out of every long-winded sentence about myself, my life, my thoughts, my wisdom, my gifts, my amateur knowledge of scripture, and whatever else would help build the throne on which I could sit. She listened patiently. Santoria had nothing to prove. I had too much to say. And then she says, I moved into Santoria's home a year after God entered my own. I made the move to LA to be discipled by, by Santoria and join the church that introduced us. And then this woman starts getting her to, like, confess all her sins, literally. She says, For her, though, the knowledge she was after was the kind that would seek to know what little and large sins I was withholding from the light. I couldn't kill what I didn't confess, or in such an infantile stage of faith as I was, I wouldn't put to death what I believed was keeping me alive. As for her and her home, she was going to make sure that whoever lived there would actually do exactly that. Live. So she starts leaving, like, this Santoria woman starts leaving her like notes around the house and telling her to do this and this and this and read this and so on. So she wakes up one morning and she says, before I sat down at the computer, I noticed a large blue book with a post-it note laid on the front cover, positioned purposefully to the left of the keyboard. It said, before you get on the computer, I want you to read and do lesson two in this book. We'll discuss it later when I get home. Uh, the lesson was titled Humility, Coming to God on His Terms. She says, What I read had knives in it. Each cut showed me what my heart had tried to keep from God. Each sentence told me that my pride was not exclusive to the outwardly arrogant people I'd come across, but it sat inside all of us, manifesting in several ways only to be discovered when the sword of the spirit pierced through the bone and marrow that housed it. So this is one of those cases of, I'm like, can you notice the difference in words here between when she talks about her life with women and her life now? This is all bones and swords and stabbing and cutting and knives. When she talks about, like, being with a woman, it was all floating on clouds and sunshine rays. And I'm like, I'm getting very different vibes here. And yet she tries to push this as being a really good thing and... I just can't get my head around it. Um, the really toxic thing that this Santoria woman says was, uh, Jackie, homosexuality is not your only issue. You will have to learn how to die so much more than that. Whether it's homosexuality, pride, fear, anger, laziness, laziness, etc. There is more than one sin in you that needs to be overcome, not just your sexuality. Yeah, and so this woman basically tells her that, you know, she's gonna help fix her and change her and make her new and all this stuff and lists all these faults with her. It's honestly a pretty typical and standard thing that controlling and abusive people do in order to control and abuse the people that they're with. They pick up on their vulnerabilities, they work at them, they make them feel like they need them and that they're reliant on them and so on. And I think it's kind of horrible. So in a later little section she goes on to say, but with us having a body made for him, meaning God, as well as the mind, will, personality and emotions that it contains, we must understand that God is after us becoming victorious over any and all sin that would hinder the whole person from serving God fully and freely. So moving away from the um, controlling friend thing for a minute and going back to controlling God, this is such a weird thing. It's like, yeah, God wants us to like be healthy and happy so we can serve him. It's like he doesn't want you to be healthy and happy for your own good so you can enjoy life and help other people. He wants you to be happy so you can obey him and serve him and worship him and look after him. It's weird. Again, I just, I couldn't get behind any religion that pushed a narrative like this, even if there was some proof that God was real. You know, it's like saying a slave owner wants to keep his slaves healthy so that they can keep being slaves to him. Later on, she talks about how uh, when, you know, she laid eyes on God, She'd laid eyes on someone worth dying for, because his death had both lifted my own and ensured I would be able to die to all that kept me from life. <sighs> it's so weird. All of this about dying and living and dying, and it's just, it's all very dark and doesn't sound very happy or nice or fulfilling, does it? The next chapter, she talks a lot about what she thinks it means to be a woman and traditional femininity and so on. She says, I don't know how it feels to be a woman anymore. My eyelashes were still long enough to hide under, 
but they could not keep the hardness in my eyes from scaring away the pretty that used to peek through. Heck, it even scared me. Who was this person looking back at me? Those eyes. Those don't hurt me or I'll break inside of myself again eyes. So again, this is a woman with some deep rooted insecurities. She's very unsure of herself. She doesn't really know who she is. And instead of addressing these underlying issues and then starting to accept herself and love herself and be kind to herself, she decides to just cover it up and be what everyone else thinks she should be. It's the worst advice I can give anyone. A lot of young people in their teens and their early 20s, myself included, will go through stages where they're unsure about who they are, where they're trying to find their identity, where they're trying things that don't always work out, where they do things that they regret, where they dress in new ways and different ways and they, they try on personas and personalities until they figure out who they are. That's completely normal, but your end goal should be to figure out what makes you happy and comfortable and what makes you the best version of you you can be. And that's going to continue to grow and change throughout the years. That's completely normal. What you shouldn't do is try and cover up who you are because you're insecure and just put on this costume that everyone else expects. You should never have to do that. She talks a little bit about how um, when she broke up with her girlfriend, like a bitch, she did it over the phone. She says things like, her tears were too loud to listen to without regret and stuff like that. She knew how much I loved her. She said, why? Why are you doing this? It made sense for her to ask it. To leave her, us, our love made no sense apart from the divine doing of God. She was both my woman and my idol, an unqualified God without an ounce of deity. She was the eye Jesus said to gouge out and the right hand he commanded me to cut off. Though it was painful as the extreme act of removing a part of the body, it was better for me to lose her than to lose my soul. I just gotta live for God now, I said with a tear-broken voice, ending us on what felt like my own undoing. A new identity was to come after I hung up. I'm, I'm starting to be at a loss for words here. This is literally like a handbook of how not to live your life what not to do. If there's anyone out there struggling with their sexuality, with their identity, especially when it comes to like people around them being kind of negative about their... Like, like if you come from a very religious family and you're struggling with your sexuality, read this book and then do the complete opposite of everything in it. Every time she says homosexuality is a sin, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. live for God, do this for God, serve God, do the opposite. Realise that no matter your sexuality, it's not a good or a bad thing, it's just a part of you that you need to accept and embrace and be comfortable with. Your life should be about making you happy and making the people you care about happy and finding what it is that makes you feel fulfilled and happy and embrace those things. Grow up understanding who you are and learn about who you are and who you want to be and who you want to grow into. Don't live your life for someone else all the time. Yeah, and then... When it comes to talking about this idea of like wo being a woman and femininity, again, I think there's no like right or wrong way to be a woman, you know? I like my pretty dresses and makeup and stuff like that, but not everyone does. My sister's more of a like jeans and a shirt kind of person. I have my like stupid long hair. My sister has this like amazing short spiky haircut that suits her face and her style. I like having fun with makeup and doing silly things, my sister never wears makeup. Is one of us more of a woman than the other? No, we're both women in our own right. And that's how gender should be. Like, it's just, and gender expression, you know, it's just about doing whatever makes you feel happy and comfortable at the time. And yeah, I sometimes wear the same kind of clothes as Sarah Jane. She doesn't wear dresses, but <laughs> the point is, we're still both women. We're both still feminine in our own ways. And like I say, there's no one right way to be a woman. So when Jackie says things like, being a woman was something I no longer knew how to be. But the real question was, had I ever known? Yes, and you were still a woman. Just because you weren't a traditionally feminine, girly, kind of woman, doesn't mean you're not a woman. I didn't own anything you'd buy in a woman's section, nor did I really want to. So don't. Simple as that. But I wore what I had until I could afford to buy what would honour what I was. Starting small, I bought a real bra. One that would affirm the way God had made my chest instead of concealment. Ah yes, God wants you to get them out for the boys. Push them up. Make them perky. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. 
boxes were, though comfortable, utterly useless for me. Mate, if it's comfortable, it's not useless, is it? Comfort should be of the utmost importance, especially when it comes to underwear. I would never wear something that was uncomfortable. Um, she so <sighs> God. She talks about how when she started wearing these like traditionally feminine clothes instead of what she was used to and comfy and felt happy in, she says it was a daily ritual of repentance. Buying these new clothes, um, it was a new identity, a new way of introducing myself to the world. You mean a new way of being who you thought everyone else wanted you to be because you didn't want to face the real you so you just decided to hide it and cover it up. She goes to a clothing shop and says the entire scene made me want to run somewhere else with clothes that I could hide behind and never be found where the insecure girl, unsure of her body and why God gave it to her, could be left to her own confusion instead of being positioned to deal with them. If I could leave the love of my life for the lover of my soul, then changing my clothes, though, though difficult, would not be as horrific as it seemed. I just, I don't get why she's like putting herself through extra pain and extra upset and extra discomfort just because she thinks it's what other people want of her. I think she's still an insecure girl unsure of her body, and the only way to get over that is to accept her body as for the way it is, to look after it and be healthy, and to dress in a way that makes you feel comfortable and confident, not in a way that other people tell you to dress. She says that when she bought new clothes, um, it would be its own kind of baptism. While immersing myself in something as natural as women's clothes would not cleanse me of my masculine ways, just as water would not wash away my sins, it would be a declaration. Yeah, and then there's lots of other things that just like speak about her insecurity and how unsure she is about herself and her lack of confidence in herself, her lack of self-esteem. Um, talking about how I knew being a woman couldn't possibly have been meant for me. I was too aggressive for the kind of low to the ground women they told me God loved. My edges were too rough to measure up to the soft ones men wanted to marry and deliver their offspring. Those women didn't look like me. I was too hard, too mean, too declarative, too sure of my words, too heavy to subdue, too unlike pink, too much like grey, too normal to notice, too much like myself to be a woman enough for everyone else. It is so sad and heartbreaking to hear these words. I just, I, I hear these things and I pity her. And I feel sorry for her, and I want to help her and tell her it's okay, but she's pushing these things as though hating yourself is normal, and how when you hate yourself, you just cover it up, and that's what you do. And yeah, no, it's just, she's going about life in all the wrong way, and I just, I wish I could do something to help her, but she's clearly kind of too far gone, and she's not going to listen to someone like me. So I guess all I can really do is talk about these things and get the message kind of out there for other people struggling with the same thing and make sure they never feel the way about themselves that Jackie felt about herself, if that makes sense. Next up in this chapter, she talks about meeting the man who is now her husband. First thing she says is, he was attractive, but I wasn't attracted. Men didn't catch my eye in the least. I only wanted to get to know this poet from Chicago because his story reminded me of my own. And then she talks about how um, she became really good friends with him and that sort of thing and then she started to think maybe she was falling in love with him which you know is understandable but for me attraction is a huge part of any relationship and marriage and without attraction yeah it is just friendship. I find it very interesting though because what we learned in the first part of the book is that she had a very rough life when it came to men. Um, her dad she felt ab abandoned by, she was abused by an older boy when she was a child, like sexually abused, so she obviously had a really bad, I guess, impression of men, and obviously that's horrible, she didn't deserve to go through any of that. I think it's something she needs to work on with a therapist, but, you know, that's just my opinion. Bearing all this in mind, I think it really explains why she felt she was falling in love with this man. Uh, she says how, when she met Preston, he saw me like God did, a woman with more baggage than she had the strength to carry, but still going somewhere, and he wasn't afraid to be my friend on the way. There were times when Preston's compass compassion shocked me. He had an actual concern for more people than himself. Who would have known that it was possible for a man to love, for him to have a heart that let other people come inside, a mind that chose to care about other things that mattered to other people? So, she thinks she might like him, like, like, like him. And it's understandable, you know, this is the first man in her life who's really shown her any kind of love or affection or kindness. And yeah, it makes sense that a woman who is unsure of herself, vulnerable, insecure, is gonna maybe get her feelings mixed up a little bit. Um, but she admits, you know, there was no attraction there, but 
yeah, I can see why she would find herself falling in love for someone that she wasn't attracted to because she finally felt safe with them. I find this passage really telling where she says, I've been a Christian for almost three years now, and I might have missed how it felt to have a crush, to have someone text at all hours of the day, talking about nothing and everything while your friends notice you smiling at your phone and ask you his name. Maybe my heart just wanted that, not him. So telling, that little bit. She says, a year went by without me saying one word to Preston about how I felt, and many words to God. Ah yes, that seems healthy. If you want to have a good relationship, start by ignoring each other for a year. Don't tell that person how you're feeling. Do it indirectly, through your imaginary friend. Just everything about this relationship has like red flags going up everywhere for me, like right from the beginning. One day she prays to God saying, God, I don't know what your will is for me and Preston, but if it is your will for us to be together, then place it on his heart to pursue me. If it's not your will, then please give me the self-control to treat him like a brother in Christ and not a crush. Yep, yeah, just put all the pressure on him. I, nothing wrong with her saying, hey mate, I'm, I'm kind of into you, do you want to give this a go? Women can make that first move too, you know? So they finally kind of like talk to each other and decide to give dating a go. She says, this new, more intentional relationship we were stepping into scared me. Even my mind couldn't handle it. It made me look at Preston differently. I got suspicious. He wasn't my friend anymore, he was a threat. Because he was a man. And men hurt things. People. Me. They always did. They always hurt what they touched, like they came into this world only to feed off the bones of women. Damaged woman who needs help. She's in no position to be giving advice to anyone. I genuinely worry about her and feel sorry for her. I didn't want Preston to have that kind of power, but I felt like he did. When I said yes to his pursuit, a war started be between us. I didn't know how to receive his love and he didn't know how to give it. That's not how a healthy relationship starts or continues, or is. It was all so uncomfortable, like learning a language you were too afraid to speak. Those hugs I thought I wanted made me cringe. Having to readjust my arms to embrace his body because he was not a woman, whose waist I could pl place my hands around and pull close, annoyed me. He was a grown man with a solid back, with shoulders that read, put your arms here instead. It didn't feel endearing or sweet, it felt like a taunt. All I could feel was his facial hair graze my skin. I'd feel the violent urge to get it away from me. I'd remember how different it felt to hug a woman, whose hands felt careless and unassuming, whose face didn't bear the fruit of testosterone. How I wanted it all to, he to end. If you ever feel so uncomfortable with another person in this way, you leave and get out of there. Relationships, physical or otherwise, should not make you feel scared or uncomfortable or anxious or sick. It should not leave you with the violent urge to get it away from you. That's not healthy. These feelings are not something you need to sit back and endure. These feelings are something you need to take note of and say, this isn't right for me. I can't believe she's actually like pushing this as like something good on the journey to this like what she now taunts as this like perfect relationship because God and not being gay or something. She says, five months had passed since we started dating and nothing had gotten easier. We were being counselled by a few leaders from my church and I was getting my own separate counselling to help me find grace in the chaos. I think you need to see a proper counsellor, like a psychiatrist counsellor. What kept us committed and unwilling to find a wider road to travel on was we knew God wanted us together. She says how she keeps thinking about women. Um, I saw my girlfriend every time I slept. I'd hear her voice and miss her. Waking up to fight another day was only half the battle. It was forgetting all that I saw before I did that that took just as much courage. Preston noticed the dark cloud I was under and was tired of acting like he didn't see it. What's wrong with you? Why are you acting so dang mean to me? He sounded angry like all of the months of my warlike behaviour had finally gotten to him. I probably had. It shouldn't be this much of a struggle to like be with someone. It's not healthy. So she turns around to him and says, You know what? I don't even know why I'm with you. Unbelief had taken my hope and my tongue. Not unbelief, love. That's the truth coming out. They're your real feelings coming out. Like, I just don't understand why I'm not with women. Because I don't want to be with you. The truth. Finally. The one bit of truth in this book. <laughs> I've been thinking it all week and couldn't hold doubt in anymore. My first real heterosexual relationship was harder than I'd ever imagined. My past haunted me and now us. This whole thing just makes me so sad for the both of them. I think it's so sad that they're both living lives that are a lie, that they're forcing themselves to play these roles that they don't really feel comfortable in. Neither of them deserve it. 
She deserves a chance to be happy and find love and a fulfilling relationship with someone she actually loves and cares about. And so does he. He deserves to be with someone who loves and cares about him and is physically attracted to him. Neither of them deserve this and it's so sad. Anyway, they break up for a little while, um, but then he's like, no, wait, I love you. Um, and she says, Preston didn't love me because he was a hopeless romantic. He loved me because he loved God more. Then six months after dating, uh, he proposes to her. She says, I answered him willingly. He could have my yes, but it would be harder for him to have my trust. And now they're engaged. Fair enough. Um, and he gets really kind of like controlling. Okay, I gotta wrap this up quickly because uh, my camera is about to overheat. We've only got this one last chapter left. But basically, as soon as they're engaged, he starts to get really controlling. He's like, so you know you gotta start trusting me now. We'd only been engaged for two minutes. Preston took advantage of our first moments alone to tell me what to do. He meant well, of course. We started premarital counselling shortly after our engagement with our pastor and his wife. This would usually end with prayer and an inquiry on the state of our purity. Nothing like too much information, is there? Uh, this was where our arguments were made public with the hope of a resolution. Our disagreements weren't creative or new, they were repetitive. He felt like I wasn't respectful enough. I felt like he wasn't patient enough. He wanted me to be more gentle. I wanted him to understand why I wasn't. This next bit I think is really, really telling. I told the woman whose love I'd loved most goodbye. I'd said hello to God, I'd changed my clothes, committed to a local church, found new friends, new hobbies, new everything. But for some reason, I couldn't make me new enough to love Preston fearlessly. Loving women was an easy thing for me. I didn't have to work to give them me. But no matter how loving he chose to be, he was still a man. A man that wasn't God. Oh god, this just screams dysfunction and messiness and just no 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 no. Ah, oh, it's so bad. Anyway, they eventually do get married and they pop out two kids and um, then she writes a book. So we're still waiting to see what happens. The last little bit I want to read from this section before we do our second video on part three or third video on part three later um, is this bit that says, from the outside looking in, it could be assumed that Preston's and my relationship was God's proof of turning a gay girl good. But really, he'd already done that the moment he'd set me free from sin. Thanks, I hate it. So yeah, there's also a lot of stuff in here about how she's literally terrified when she's getting married. She doesn't want to walk down the aisle, she feels sick, this, this, this. It's just, it all screams unhealthiness, unhappiness, and it's not something I would ever want for anyone, and it's really heartbreaking to read. This section of the book did make me feel really sad for her, really bad for her, and it was really upsetting for me. We'll talk about some of the thoughts I've had about this book in general a little more in the next video where I look at part three, in which she tries to give some practical advice for other people going through the same stuff. Um, but for now, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on everything I've spoken about in this video so far. If you can, please check out the charity link um, down in the description below in the pinned comment. And if you can donate a little bit, that would be really, really amazing. Otherwise, join us on our charity stream on the 5th of March, I think it is. Hopefully I'll see you guys there. If not, I'll probably see you in another video before then, or three, I don't know. Um, but I'll see you guys again soon. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for watching today, I really appreciate you guys so much, and a huge thank you goes out to everyone who supported me on Patreon this month, including Gambit in a Chauffeur, Day Sean, Data Jack, Rachel B. Royer, Heidi Matilla, Jaden Shepard, Corthy, Jaylee Moore, Sir Michael Moore, Christian Opitz, Sage Valorial, Greg Ladd, and Lauren Hart. And to everyone else supporting me on Patreon, you guys are amazing, I love you so much. Don't forget, if you want to see more stuff from me, go follow me over on Instagram, at Rachel Oates, with a zero, not an O, because I'm annoying. I've also got a merch store if you want to check that out, I'm going to be doing some really cool stuff with it this year. But you know, no pressure, Wh whatever. <laughs> I'll see you guys again soon.